ahead and get started. Says it's connecting. Hold on just one second. There we go. Okay. Um, I know at the beginning of the semester it might have been hard to see. Um, we've gone through a lot, covered a lot of material, but here we are. It's time for the final exam. Um, so this is all that is remaining in this course. Okay, so it is a comprehensive final exam. Uh, however, I would say that the past couple of blood bank exams have also been comprehensive um, in that it has included material from previous lectures as well. Um, so no new material. Um, everything we've already covered, just make sure you study, taking it all the way back to the um, sugars on the oligosaccharide that determine your blood type, right? So make sure you review all of that. Um, and um, if you have done well in this course, this uh, final exam should be um, fairly easy for you if you are prepared, I will say that. All right, so what you can expect, um, the exam is going to have 84 questions. It is worth 100 points. Question format will include multiple choice matching true and false. Uh, um, several of the questions will be similar to the blood, blood bank practical online exam two that you guys are taking and it is due today. Um, so if you are prepared for that practical exam um, and you study previous um, you know what I'll do? I'll open up uh, previous exams as well for blood banks so you can go back and review some of the previous questions from exams. Um, that way you will know what you missed, maybe identify some areas of weakness to review. Um, I will open those up um, as soon as we finish uh, the review today. So that might be another tool to study. Also in your um, module five content folder in Blackboard, there are some final exam practice questions. Um, these are not to be submitted for a grade. They're just another study tool. There is a document that contains just the questions um, and then there is a provided answer key so you can check yourself. Um, so if you use that as a study tool and feel confident in the material, um, that's another good way to study for this exam as well. Again, do not submit that. That is not a required assignment. It's just further practice for you. Um, there's also a final exam outline review in your lecture manual at the very end. Um, it's detailed. So again, another um, way to know which content to study. Um, and if you remember Solo 6 that you guys turned in with um, exam 5, it is kind of all-encompassing. It puts all of the blood bank topics together, antibody identification, um, characteristics of each antibodies, what class they're in, IgG versus IgM, what phase of uh, reaction or phase of testing do they like to react at, such as your RH antibodies will react at 37 degrees and then typically will get stronger at AHG. Um, and then your Lewis antibodies are IgM, really considered a nuisance in blood bank. Um, so make sure that you review all of those characteristics of those antibodies as well. Um, no grading of reactions on this exam, so you don't have to worry about the variability in answers, so no concern about losing points, whether you call it a 4 plus versus a 3 plus or a 1 plus or 2 plus. However, you will be required to make the interpretations, okay? Don't forget about your subgroups of A, being able to identify if your patient is A2 with anti-A1. Um, versus a cold reacting aloe antibody, um, such as an anti-M that might cause a ABO discrepancy as well. So that really requires looking at your ABO discrepancy as well as looking at your IAT. Um, so if you have a patient that is forward typing as an A, back typing as an O, um, and their IAT is two plus at initial spin on one of the screening cells, well, you know that that patient has a cold reacting aloe antibody and probably um, your A1 cells are positive for that antigen, okay? Um, so being able to differentiate your cold reacting 
antibodies that can cause an ABO discrepancy versus a true A1, uh, A2 patient with anti-A1, right? So make sure you look at all of your patient information that is given. All right, so just to review, remember what sugar is on your red cell membrane to determine your patient's blood type. Remember that it is the um, N-acetylgalactosamine that um, if that is added on to your oligosaccharide, then your patient will be type A. Um, and if it's the D-galactose um, antigen that's added on to the oligosaccharide, then your patient will be B. Um, if your patient has both of those sugars, then that would make your patient AB. If your patient doesn't have any of those sugars added and only has the l fucose sugar, then neither the A or the B antigen is being expressed on the red cell. So that means our patient is type O, okay? And then think about once you know what sugars are on the oligosaccharide, um, then that will determine how they react with our given antisera. So for instance, if your patient has the N um, acetyl galactosamine sugar on their cell membrane, then, and we add anti-A, that anti-A is going to bind to the A antigen. Um, and therefore we will see agglutination in our ABO testing. All right, so in this example on the screen, notice that this is our patient red cell. Both the N um, galactosamine or N acetylgalactosamine sugar and D galactose are on this red cell. So that makes our patient AB. If we were to add these patient cells, antisera, anti A, comma B, um, Remember, anti-A comma B, it's not a combination of anti-A and anti-B. It's its own separate molecule produced by group O people, um, but it will react with both the A antigen and the B antigen. So if we get a four plus agglutination um, with anti-A, anti-B, and A comma B, then our patient's ABO would be AB, okay? All right, on the right side of the screen, make sure you guys understand um, when we do our phenotyping of red cells. Think about your red cell, all right? So here we have, um, in this diagram, we have the patient red cell with the antigens that are being expressed, all right? So take a look at your JKA and JKB. Both antigens are being expressed on this red cell membrane. That means our patient is heterozygous. Okay, heterozygous positive for JKA and JKB. Also, um, we have the D antigen being expressed. We have the little c antigen being expressed and the E antigen being expressed. So those are our RH um, antigens being expressed as well as M and N, right? So this patient is heterozygous for M and N. However, if you look is positive for Cal. So he has a big K and little k being expressed on this um, cell. So how does our phenotyping react when we mix our antisera with this patient's cells? So for anti-M, if we added anti-M reagent with this patient's cell, we would have agglutination. So we would see um, a positive reaction. With anti-little s, we would also see a positive reaction because the little s antigen is being expressed. Um, if we were to add anti-chelano reagent with this patient cells, then yes, we would get a positive reaction as well because the antigen is being expressed. However, if the A is not included in his antigenic expression in this example, so when we do our phenotyping, antigen typing, whichever terminology you want to use, it would result in a negative reaction. Right? So no agglutination indicates that the patient is lacking the antigen. Their phenotype would be antigen negative, okay? 
And then also, and um, we'll talk a, a little bit about this later too, dosage, right? So don't forget about dosage um, when you're selecting your panel cells for um, when you're performing phenotyping, you want your positive control to be a heterozygous. And the reason for that is we want to make sure our antisera can detect the weakest antigenic expression, all right? Um, and that's just because we want to get a true, accurate phenotype of our patients. If they have a very weak expression of the antigen, we want our antisera to be able to detect it. So by choosing a heterozygous positive control, um, we are making sure that antisera can detect the weakest reaction, okay? Um, and then don't ever forget about dosage when you're doing your antibody identification. Um, keep in mind that if a, a panel cell is heterozygous, all right, remember, we just said that heterozygous cells have the weaker antigen expression. So the number of antigen binding sites for that specific antigen is going to be decreased because it is sharing the amount of available binding sites between the, both of the antigens included in that haplotype, all right? For instance, JA and JKB, all right? So that reduces the number of antigen sites on the cell. So if your patient has the corresponding antibody, there are not as many binding sites, so you will see a weaker reaction in your patient's plasma. Um, we really will see that with um, Duffy A and Duffy B are known for dosage. JKA and JKB are also known for dosage. M and N, um, and you might even see it in our RH family as well, all right? So you need to make sure that you know which antigens um, travel together are inherited as an haplotype to determine which ones are heterozygous versus homozygous, okay? So big C, little c, big E, little e, M and N, Duffy A, Duffy B, big S, little s, JKA, JKB, Lewis A, Lewis B, um, Kel and Chilano, right? So those are your pairs that you always want to look for homozygous versus heterozygous state, especially if you're trying to um, identify an antibody and maybe your pattern of reactivity doesn't match perfect or um, you have some variant strengths of reaction, right? We always want to try to explain our variant um, reaction strengths. And dosage will definitely cause that as well. Just another note, if you do on your antibody identification, if you do have variant strengths of reaction, um, keep in mind dosage, right? Another possible reason, multiple antibodies present, all right? So typically if your patient has multiple antibodies present, and maybe um, the panel cell where both of those antigens are present, that will give you a stronger reaction um, versus the cell that only one of those antigens is present to the corresponding antibodies, okay? Um, that will result in varying reactions. And um, so this schematic just very um, further demonstrates heterozygous versus homozygous. Remember, in homozygous, all of the antigen sites for those haplotypes are the same, right? So you can see how there are many more antigen sites available for binding, which is why we typically get stronger reactions with homozygous cells. Versus heterozygous, um, and an example would be JKA and JKB, they must share the binding sites. So there are a decreased number of binding sites, both JKA and JKB. Therefore, our patient's antibody typically will react weaker, okay? I mean, it doesn't have to. Sometimes your reaction strengths might be the same, whether um, that panel cell is homozygous versus heterozygous. Um, it does happen quite a bit in blood bank. We do see dosage, especially among the kid family. All right, so taking it back, you guys probably remember talking about the Lewis blood group system. Remember, the Lewis blood group system is actually different, not like our RH family, not like Duffy A and Duffy B, meaning that it is actually not um, attached to the red cell membrane. It is produced 
um, by tissue cells. Um, and if you're a secretor, it's found in your saliva and other body fluids. And then if you have the Lewis gene, then it is absorbed on to the red cell membrane. So the Lewis blood group system is actually very similar to our ABO blood group system in that sugars are incorporated um, onto the oligosaccharide membrane of the red cell, all right? So remember, the Lewis um, phenotype is dependent upon three genes, okay? You have to have the um, H substance, you have the Lewis substance, and then you have your secretor status. If the, we all know if the H gene, right, if you have the H gene, then that l fucose is going to be added on to the oligosaccharide chain. If you have the Lewis gene, then Lewis A will be absorbed onto your red cell membrane. The only way a patient can be Lewis B positive is if they have the Lewis gene, they have the uh, H gene, and they are a secretor, right? If you are a secretor um, and you have the Lewis gene and you have the H substance, that Lewis gene is going to um, mask your Lewis A. So if you are a secretor, Lewis, and have H, then Lewis B is going to be absorbed onto the red cell membrane. Um, Lewis A is also going to be absorbed onto the membrane, but Lewis B will actually mask the Lewis A. All right. Um, that is the only time your patient will be Lewis B positive is if they have all three genes, okay? I mean, this example is taken from your textbook. It just further differentiates what I just said, all right? So if you have um, the H substance, then the l fucose is added onto the oligosaccharide. Whether or not you're a secretor or the H substance, if you have the Lewis gene, Lewis A will be absorbed onto your red cell membrane, okay? However, in order to be Lewis B, you have to have the H substance, the Lewis substance, and you have to be a secretor. So you have to have the secretor gene. And so this just kind of differentiates. Remember that we talked about the Lewis is, um, if you're a secretor, it's found in your secretions um, on a type one chain. All right, so this table is found in your textbook and I just wanted to point out what I already said. Notice um, this table gives you the genes that are present, the antigens that will be present in the secretions as well as our red cell phenotype. If you notice, there is only one scenario where our patient is Lewis uh, B positive, and that is when all three genes are present. The Lewis gene, um, the secretor gene, and the H gene are all uh, present. That means you're gonna have Lewis A, Lewis B, and H, in your secretions, all right, so the H is adding the l fucose um, sugar onto the oligosaccharide, Lewis is adding the Lewis A, and then Lewis B is also going to be incorporated onto that oligosaccharide, and it is going to mask the Lewis A, all right? So um, our phenotyping will be Lewis A negative, Lewis B positive. That is the only time our patients can be Lewis B positive. All three genes must be present. Um, and remember I said, regardless of what your H status is, if your patient is Lewis, uh, has the Lewis substance, then they will be Lewis A positive. So notice in that first um, row there, the patient has the Lewis gene. They're a non-secretor, right? A non-secretor is little se, little se, all right? So they don't have the secretor status. So notice only Lewis A is in their secretions. Um, and then H is present as well. So they are Lewis A positive. Um, versus another example, um, 
one, two, three, fifth row down where you have the Lewis gene, a non-secretor, um, and then no H substance being um, uh, created either. We still have Lewis A, all right? So our phenotype is Lewis A positive B negative, okay? Um, so as long as that Lewis substance is there, regardless of the secretor status, regardless of the H status, you will be um, Lewis A positive, okay? This in the last two examples, um, we don't have the Lewis substance being uh, produced, all right? So little e, little e, meaning that the Lewis gene is not there, it's an amorph. Um, and so notice that these two, the last two examples are Lewis A negative, Lewis B negative, um, because there is actually no Lewis substance being produced at all, okay? I know that's taken it way back to the beginning of the course. Sarah, oh, you have a question? Yes, um, how, I, I understand that, that those two are amorphs at the bottom, but the third row down, where you also have an amorph, but you do have the H substance, there's like not a situation where you would ever have to differentiate that, right? Or is that only... Um, in our serological testing, no, we would not be able to differentiate that. You would definitely okay. have to take that to the molecular level. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so for our serological testing, we will only be able to tell if the patient is Lewis A positive or Lewis B uh, positive or negative. So that is, for blood bank, that is all um, we'll be able to tell in our serological testing. Um, but I will say your board of certification, the ASCP, they love to pull questions from um, the genes expressed, which determines your red cell phenotype for Lewis. Um, that, the, that would be a really good uh, board of certification question. All right, so some additional information. Um, you guys don't forget that complement may appear in the AHG phase. So remember complement um, is a concern in blood bank because some of our IG, or all of our IgM antibodies have the capability of activating complement, um, which we will see at initial spin. Um, typically, we see complement because IgM are cold reacting antibodies. Typically, we will see complement um, involved at room temperature testing. They will typically go away at 37 degrees. Um, and because complement is involved in the IgM, sometimes we will see complement reacting at AHG phase, especially if the AHG reagent being used is polyspecific, meaning that it has both anti-IgG and anti-C3B, C3D, okay? Um, so that is one reason if you have reactions at initial spin and they go away at 37, but then come back at AHG, you might always want to suspect complement. And then you also might want to investigate what type of AHG reagent you're using um, and make sure that you are using the monospecific IgG. That will eliminate those AHG reactions from complement. Um, and just to review some differences among our AHG Antisera, remember polyspecific AHG contains both anti-IgG and anti-C3B, C3D, okay? And then you have your monospecific AHG, which are two different Antisera. You have your monospecific anti-IgG and your monospecific anti-C3B, C3D. Um, so if you were doing your DAT testing, you would definitely start with your polyspecific. If you had a positive reaction with polyspecific, then you would take that uh, a further and do your monospecific IgG testing, monospecific C3B, C3D to determine exactly what is coding patient cells in vivo. Um, make sure you guys are familiar with your RH genotypes, um, referring to the C, D, and E antigen using your Fisher race. Um, language and your Weiner nomenclature as well. Uh, and we have an example coming up that will uh, go over that. Um, if you were given some IAT results, make sure that you are able to differentiate if it is an allo antibody versus an auto antibody. And one way that you can do that, if your auto control is positive, meaning that patient cells are reacting with its own patient plasma. 
that indicates that there is a, a autoantibody present. I mean, we've had several examples, both in lecture and lab, differentiating between an alloantibody and an autoantibody. So remember all of those questions that we typically ask when we're interpreting an IAT. Do you suspect an alloantibody versus an autoantibody? Is it a single antibody or multiple antibodies? And remember how you can answer that question if you have varying strengths of reaction at different phases. So let's say you have some reactions um, one cell reacts at initial spin, negative at 37, negative at AHG, and then your other cell is only reactive at AHG. That indicates that you have a cold reacting antibody and a antibody that's reacting at AHG. So that would indicate multiple antibodies present, right? So um, a really good way to study for this exam is kind of review both your lecture material and your lab material. There was one lab, I believe it was lab five and six, where you had um, some IAT uh, interpretations. Is it a single antibody, multiple antibody, alloantibody, autoantibody, IgG, IgM? Um, those are some questions um, interpreting those IAT results. And um, we also talked about HLA frequencies. Remember, so based on the um, inheritance pattern of your HLA antigens, you get all of your HLA antigens inherited as a haplotype, so one from each parent. So the more siblings you have, the more likely you are to be able to find a um, complete HLA match. So if you have five siblings, then it's a 99.8% chance um, one of your siblings will be a perfect HLA match. Um, so in the, if you ever needed a bone marrow transplant, um, your siblings would be the most appropriate donor. Um, if you're ever thinking about having um, an H, uh, if you ever need an HLA match donor, the parents are often not the best source of HLA because um, you only inherit one haplotype from the parent. So while they'll have the same haplotype, if you were to do a transplant, then your, your body is not going to recognize the uh, donor. And even though they're the same haplotype, your body won't be able to stop graft versus host, right? And that is one reason that we always irradiate products from a first degree relative, right? Um, and then don't forget our um, compatibility testing, all right? So if you think about patient's blood type, if and whether, since we don't really do whole blood any longer in the blood bank, very rare do we get whole blood, um, we need to make sure that we know what products can be transfused safely to our patients depending on their ABO, um, red cells versus plasma products. So for red cells, if your patient is type A, that means they have the A antigen on their red cell, they can safely receive A red cells or O red cells, okay? Um, for plasma, because our patients have the A antigen on their red cells, we would not want to give them plasma from a B patient that has anti-A in their plasma, all right? That donors anti-A would attack the recipient's A cells. So for plasma, we can give them type A or we can give them AB. Um, and the reason you have to think about that backwards is because the AB patients have both the A antigen and the B antigen on their red cells. And remember Landsteiner's rule, if you lack the antigens, you can build the antibodies, all right? So because our AB patients have both the A antigen and the B antigen, they lack anti-A and anti-B, all right? So AB is our universal plasma donor, all right? AB can go to any um, type for plasma products, all right? Versus red cells, O is the universal donor for our red cell products, okay? That is why AB patients for red cells can receive A, B, AB, or O products, but for plasma, they can only receive A, B, okay? 
Um, and then just a little bit review on RH. Remember an RH positive patient can receive RH positive or RH negative products. Um, if your patient is RH negative, they should only receive RH negative products to prevent the um, alloimmunization to anti, uh, of anti-D. However, um, in trauma situations or for those patients that are using a large volume of products and they are males, um, we will switch them over to RH positive um, to conserve our RH negatives. However, you never ever want to do that for a female who is within childbearing age. Um, that will cause that female to build anti-D. And as we have seen um, in evaluating hemolytic disease of the newborn, anti-D could be fatal to um, fetus, okay? Um, and just a note about weak D patients. So if your patient is weak D, they are considered RH positive. All right, so if you're trying to transfuse an RH positive patient, they can receive RH positive um, products. And just a note about the donor testing, it is very important if you are ever involved um, at a donor facility and you're involved in determining the donor's ABORH, it's very important to identify those weak D patients. If the donor facility misses a weak D positive patient and that donor is labeled as RH negative, when indeed they are RH positive, what type of patient is that wrongly labeled RH negative unit going to go to? It's going to go to an RH negative patient, but indeed that unit is RH positive. And you guys remember the D antigen is the most antigenic second to ABO, all right? So even a small amount of exposure to the D antigen can cause alloimmunization, right? So that is why weak D testing is so important in the donor collection process. Um, and just a further note about HLA frequencies. Um, remember, the more siblings you have, the better chance that you have. Um, if you have um, uh, one sibling, or, well, so if you have two siblings, then you have a 25% chance. So the more siblings um, you have, the better chance you have. So if you have five siblings, it's a 99% chance. I think I um, said 99.8 earlier, but somewhere, somewhere around that 99% chance of finding an exact HLA match. All right, so some um, example questions. What results are affected by a cold autoantibody? Um, so cold autoantibody, we might see it interfere with our back type. Remember the key word there is cold. So it will react at initial spin or room temperature. So it might interfere with our back type. It's going to interfere with the initial spin testing of our IAT. Um, and if you are using polyspecific AHG in your AHG phase of testing, it could also cause some positive reactions in your AHG. Um, and the key word there is autoantibody. So we expect a positive DAT and that initial spin uh, cross match will also be affected. Um, and then we already talked about what stages. So we'll see it at initial spin and um, AHG phase of testing as well. All right, so if you have uh, patient plasma reacts with adult O cells and you're thinking about a cold autoantibody, would you suspect that it would be due to anti big I or anti little I? To answer this question, you have to understand that 100% of adult cells will have the I antigen. All right, remember the little i antigen is only found on cord cells. So if you have plasma that reacts with um, all adult O cells, we typically are going to suspect anti-big I. If you had a autoantibody um, that only reacted with cord cells, then we would suspect anti-little I. Um, if you have a cold antibody is present, um, why does it react at AHG for the IAT and the cross match? 
Um, that is because a cold antibody, usually of IgM classification, can activate complement. So we will see that at initial span and also the AHG. How can you prevent a cold antibody reaction in the IAT? Um, typically, we can um, warm it. So you can pre-warm your plasma, pre-warm your screening cells. That's what we call a, a pre-warm technique. Um, otherwise, you can make sure that in the AHG phase of testing, you are using monospecific IgG. That will eliminate the um, interference of complement. Um, so a negative auto in the IAT rules out what type of discrepancy, um, and that would be a cold um, autoantibody. All right, so if your auto control is negative, remember that um, indicates that it's not an autoantibody, it is a alloantibody, okay, such as anti-M, uh, P1, those types of cold reacting antibodies. And remember Rouleau. Rouleau will affect our reverse typing, okay? So if you have Rouleau on a um, group A patient, your back type is going to be like an O patient, all right? And as well as your IAT is going to be positive on everything. Um, and usually you'll have the same strength of reaction, um, both in your back type and your IAT. Okay, and remember, how can we dissipate Rouleau? We can do the saline replacement. So after, um, during the saline replacement process, you remove your patient plasma, add in the same amount of saline, centrifuge, and read for agglutination. That saline should dissipate the Rouleau. However, if the antibody is really there, the um, sensitization has already occurred. All right, so the agglutination should still occur even after um, adding saline, All right? So we should see, see true agglutination there. Um, make sure that you can perform antibody identification on a panel um, and make sure that you can perform the crossing out procedure and then be able to identify the ones that have not completely been ruled out. And then what further steps should be taken to rule out those antibodies, whether it be selecting um, rule out cells or select cells, whether it be performing an enzyme, a neutralization, all of those special techniques that we talked about um, in blood bank. And we have an example of a panel that we're going to do um, in a future slide. All right, so just like I mentioned, if you want to confirm a suspected antibody and you haven't completely ruled out others, what can you do? So remember, when you're choosing select cells, for whatever antibody you suspect, you want your select cells to be negative for that antibody, positive for the specific antigens that you're trying to rule out. Um, so if you have a suspected anti-Duffy A, but big E is not ruled out, you would want to choose a Duffy A negative cell, big E positive cell, all right? That way, if you have a reaction in your plasma, you know that it is not due to Duffy A, something else. There's another underlying antibody there, okay? Can any of your RH antibodies cause a hemolytic transfusion reaction? And the answer for that is yes. Um, they are capable of causing a hemolytic transfusion reaction. Remember, um, the D is included in that RH family, and he is the second most antigenic next to our ABO. So our ABO antibodies can cause a hemolytic transfusion reaction, which is what would happen if a patient received the wrong type of blood, um, and then as well as our RHs have that capability as well. All right, so um, this panel is an example, um, and you guys make sure that you are able to perform the crossing off procedure. Um, and so some of the questions that might be asked from a panel, um, what is the most likely antibody? Which antibodies are not ruled out? Is the suspected antibody IgG or IgM? 
is the suspected antibody clinically significant? Um, what's causing the varying strengths of reaction? Is it um, dosage? Is it multiple antibodies present? And is the rule of three followed? So remember the rule of three um, means that you have to have three panel cells that are antigen positive that result in a positive reaction in your patient plasma, as well as three cells that are negative and provide a negative reaction in your patient plasma. So three positives, three negatives, that will help us reach the 95% confidence level in antibody identification. All right, so if you look at this example um, and you do your crossing out procedure, one of the things you should always ask yourself, you should always look at your pattern of reactivity. And what I mean by pattern of reactivity is every cell that has the antigen also provides a reaction in your patient plasma. So in the example here, if you just look at your pattern of reactivity, there is one antigen that is present on every cell that provided a positive reaction in our patient plasma, and that is JKA, okay? So notice JKA is heterozygous positive, all right? So it's positive for JKA and JKB on panel cell number one, resulted in a two plus reaction. However, panel cell four had a, it's homozygous positive for JKA, negative for JKB. It's because that cell is homozygous that we see a stronger reaction. We have a three plus reaction. Um, and then the same for panel cell number nine as well. It's homozygous um, versus panel cell five and six is heterozygous positive for JKA and JKB. Okay, so those are some questions you need to ask yourself. Does my pattern of reactivity match? If you had a, an additional cell that was positive and did not match up with JKA, that could indicate the presence of another antibody. All right, so we always wanna make sure that we identify all underlying antibodies. Um, and that's why we would also utilize some of our um, additional testing techniques if needed as well. Um, whether we need to run an enzyme uh, panel or perform a neutralization, depending on what antibodies you suspected. For this example, um, because we have reactions at AHG and we have um, identified our antibody as JKA, JKA is of the IgG classification, um, so make sure you know which antibodies, um, their characteristics, what phase they, they like to react at, um, and what um, classification they are, IgG or IgM. And because this antibody is an IgG, um, it is considered clinically significant. It's reacting at AHG phase of temperature or phase of um, react reactivity, phase of testing. Therefore, it will react in vivo inside our patient, all right? So it is clinically significant, capable of crossing the placenta, causing hemolytic disease of the newborn and causing a transfusion reaction. And if you were to do the crossing off procedure on this panel, um, there is one antibody that is not crossed off and it is KEL. KEL is only half crossed off. Um, so in order to rule out KEL, you would want to run some rule out cells or select cells. You would want to choose JKA negative, KEL positive, all right? There's some other antibodies. Um, look, take a look at K KPA and JSA in your kale family. Notice every panel cell is negative for those cells, all right? Those are private antigens. Um, the majority of the population is gonna be negative. So while we can't rule them out, do you think they are capable of causing these reactions? No, so while they're not completely ruled out, um, should we worry about them? They're very rare. Again, they're private antigens. The majority of the population are going to be antigen negative. Um, so oftentimes, and you'll want to make sure when you start working in blood bank what the procedure is, it will be very difficult to find KPA positive, JSA positive cells. Um, so a lot of times blood bank will not spend the time ruling those out. All right.
All right, so there's one more thing um, that we can determine from that panel. We can determine our Fisher race genotype by looking at the phenotype of our patient. All right, so given down here, this last row of the panel, this are your patient cells, all right? Um, our patient cells were D positive, big C negative, big E negative, little c positive, little e. So we can determine our Fisher race um, terminology for this patient. Now keep in mind, um, there is actually no little d antigen, right? So you're either D positive or D negative. So you, you get that from two alleles. Um, and if only the D antigen is being expressed on one allele, you're still considered D positive. So from this, serological testing of D positive, we don't know if that patient has the D antigen being expressed on both alleles or just one. So that is why in, um, you could potentially have two different scenarios in this option, all right? So you could be big D, little c, little e, and on the other allele you could be little d, little c, little e, or you could be big D, little c, little e, big D, little c, little e. All right, so that's why we have two different scenarios uh, for this patient, because we don't know the uh, genotype of the D um, allele expression. And so just here, it, that uh, Fisher race language is written out based on the uh, antigen typing results from the previous panel. Again, big D, little c, little e, little d, little c, little e, or it would be your um, R not little r, that's your Weiner language. And then big D, little c, little e, big D, little c, little e, or um, R not r not, big R not. All right, so make sure you're familiar with your Fisher race language and your Weiner nomenclature as well. Um, and just another note why we don't have big C and big E included in that RH genotype, um, because our antigen typing tells us that the patient is big C negative, big E negative as well. So that big C antigen is not being expressed, that big E antigen is not being expressed either. Um, how does dosage appear on the panel? Dosage um, will uh, cause varying strengths of reaction, right? So your heterozygous positive cells will cause weaker reactions, right? In blood bank, do not ever forget about dosage. I know we keep harping on that. Um, and remember how are our IgG antibodies acquired? Remember, in order to build IgG antibodies, you must have had prior exposure. Um, and that type of exposure is either through a previous transfusion or for females, they have, have a previous pregnancy. And the way pregnancy plays a role there is the fetus inherits a antigen expression from the father that the mother is antigen negative for, all right? So um, the baby is, are, uh, is antigen positive, mom is antigen negative, and during the exchange of fetal maternal, mom is exposed to fetal cells, she could build that antibody, okay? For IgG antibodies, um, not ABO, remember, that does not affect her current pregnancy. She will build the antibody. It will affect her future pregnancies, all right? So that's the difference between um, hemolytic disease of the newborn due to ABO. That can occur because she has already built those IgM ABO antibody or their IgG ABO antibodies that can cross the placenta. She's already built those, okay, versus IgG antibodies, non-ABO, hemolytic disease of the newborn, she builds it in the current pregnancy, causes problems for her subsequent pregnancies, all right? So that's a little bit difference between ABO and your um, other IgG antibodies in hemolytic disease of the newborn.
So in our donor testing, and if you think about what our donor testing includes, we're going to do ABORH to include wheat D testing if indicated. Um, we're going to perform an IAT. We're going to perform all of the um, infectious disease testing. If our donor has a positive IAT, should the blood be used? All right, so that means our patient has a circulating antibody in their plasma. Um, and if you think about the way component processing is now, we separate out all of the components, red cells, platelets, and plasma. If our patient has a positive IAT, meaning they have an antibody in their plasma, we can still use their red cells. However, their plasma should not be used for transfusions. We would definitely want to discard that plasma. And the next question asks, um, asks about selecting panel cells to appropriately choose a positive control when performing phenotyping, whether you're performing phenotyping on the patient or you're doing donor testing. Remember, that positive control must be heterozygous, okay? We want to make sure that our antisera can detect the weakest expression of that antigen. Remember we talked about our enzyme treated cells, whether it be Fison or Pepain. Um, remember enzyme will enhance your RH in kid, all right? Um, it will destroy your MN and S and Duffy systems, all right? So if you think you are dealing with multiple antibodies, um, let's say you have a Duffy A, you think there might be an underlying alloantibody, you could perform a enzyme treated panel, it will destroy those Duffy antigen sites, and then that will allow um, negative reactions in your panel. Therefore, you can identify any underlying allo antibodies. Which results are affected when cold or warm autoantibodies are present? For a cold and of autoantibody, you're typically going to see reactions at room temperature, all right? Your back type may be affected. Your IAT is gonna be positive at initial spin. Your auto control is going to be positive as well at initial spin, all right? Typically with cold reacting autoantibodies, they will warm away. So you will have a negative reaction at 37, a negative reaction at AHG versus warm autoantibodies, okay? Keyword is warm. Typically you'll have negative reactions at initial spin, um, maybe positive reactions at 37, but definitely positive reactions at AHG. And that's pan reactivity, all right? Meaning that every cell is gonna be positive, including the auto control. Your DAT is gonna be positive. Um, your elution will be positive. Um, and one way to get rid of these warm autoantibodies is by performing a um, absorption. And then how is a cold or warm alloantibody worked up? Um, of course, we have to do a panel um, and depending on um, if it's cold or warm um, and the results of the DAT, you'll have to do an elution as well. When we think about transfusion, transfusing our patients, um, what component would be most indicated for bleeding disorders? So typically if our patients have a bleeding disorders, maybe they have a coagulation factor deficiency, um, the most indicated product would be uh, fresh frozen plasma in that instance. Keeping in mind there are factor concentrates as well um, that are readily available now for factor eight deficiencies, uh, factor seven and nine deficiencies. Um, so if you're performing a cross match and your unit is compatible at 37 degrees and AHG, but not at initial spin, what should be um, performing? What should be uh, performed? So we're having some positive reactions at initial spin. This means um, that at 37 degrees, the um, antibody is being dissociated. Um, so that indicates a cold reacting antibody. We could recommend the use of a blood warmer 
before administering that unit. And then if you identify your patient um, as having an antibody, what product requirements should you implement for transfusion? So remember, if your patient has an antibody, you wanna make sure that we give antigen negative, cross-match compatible. And if your patient has a antibody in their current sample or ever identified in their history, you wanna make sure you do cross-match testing at all three phases, initial spin, 37, and AHG. It's possible that patients have an antibody identified years ago and then we receive a current sample um, and then their IAT is negative, meaning that the titer of that antibody has dropped to undetectable levels. It is very important that blood banks still honor those previously identified antibodies by providing antigen negative blood to prevent a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. Um, in the event a patient with a known antibody is exposed to that antigen positive blood, then that could initiate an amnestic response, all right? That antibody titer IgG is gonna jump um, up, all right? And then the patient will present with um, symptoms of a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. Um, just real quick, let's talk about requirements for cross-matching. Remember, if your lab has a verified computer system, meaning that your computer has been validated and has the capability to perform electronic cross-matching, there are some requirements, all right? Your patient must never have had an antibody identified, no ABO discrepancies, must have a historical type on file performed by a different technologist. All right, all of that criteria must be met in order for electronic cross matches um, to, be, to be eligible for electronic cross matches. In the event your patient does not have an established history, maybe you're the first person performing that ABO, RH, and IAT testing, your patient has to have initial spin. All right, so remember the criteria for initial spin. I um, mean, if your hospital is not validated for electronic cross matches, you will always have to perform initial spin testing. Remember, initial spin testing is the final ABO compatibility verification. If you are trying to give a donor type A red cells to an O patient, that's an ABO incompatibility. I want you guys to understand that is going to result in a four plus initial spin reaction during the cross match, all right? So you'll have four plus that initial spin. It's not gonna go away. If you carry that through all phases of the cross match, initial spin 37 and AHG, it's gonna be four plus across the board. And so if you ever see a four plus reaction at all three phases, your first automatic thought should be in ABO incompatibility, okay? Um, and then anytime your patient, again, has a history of an antibody or has an antibody that it has identified in that current sample testing, all three phases must be included, initial spin, 37, and AHG. So if you're performing um, RH testing on a patient and it's negative at initial spin, um, but the weak D control is positive. What, how does that interpret, how does your RH interpret it? Remember, if your RH control is positive, that invalidates your D testing, all right? So you would be able to report your ABO, um, but you could not report out that RH. A weak D control usually indicates maybe your patient has a positive DAT, um, and so further investigation needs to be made as to why that weak D is positive, why that patient's DAT is positive. It could also be what type of reagent is being used for your weak D control. If it's a high protein reagent, could be causing some false positives, you could definitely repeat that with a monoclonal polyclonal blend um, to see if that um, RH control tube goes negative.
Remember, um, in the event that your patient does have a positive DAT and you're not able to get an accurate RH um, interpretation on them, you could perform, so that means something is coding patient cells reacting with our antisera. You could perform an elution. It's the glycine EDTA. What it does is, is it will dissociate the antigen from the patient red cells However, it is not a lysine elution, all right? It, it um, saves the cells. So it dissociates that antigen, but the cells are still viable. So what's gonna happen is after that glycine EDTA treatment, the cells are still viable for testing. We can repeat that DAT. If the DAT is negative, that means that the antibody is no longer coding patient cells, and then we can perform our RH testing. We would repeat our RH testing, um, and then that would give us a valid RH typing, okay? So thinking about um, hemolytic disease of the newborn cases, if the baby has a positive RH control, and a positive DAT, what's most likely the cause? Um, so in this phenomenon, you always wanna think about if your patient has a positive DAT and a positive RH control, it's maternal antibody is coding baby cells, okay? Um, there's a phenomenon that we actually talked about where you would see this, it's the blocked D phenomenon. Um, where anti-D would be your antibody. Baby is actually RH positive, but mom's anti-D, and usually you'll see this with a very high titer, mom's anti-D has is bound to all of the baby's D antigen sites. So it's actually blocking the D antigen sites. So when we do our D testing, um, initial spin is gonna be negative, but the weak D and the RH control, because of the addition of the AHG reagent, we will have positive reactions. One way that you will see that is your RH control is gonna be positive in the weak D phase of testing. So that's the blocked D phenomenon. Um, and then what type of reagent should be used for the weak D positive control, like I mentioned earlier, um, you would want to make sure you're using a monoclonal polyclonal blend um, to make sure you're not getting false positives. So if you have transfused a patient and then a couple of weeks later they present with symptoms of a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction, um, but on initial testing their IAT was negative, why would that be? Um, and that's just because some of these antibodies have the characteristics to their titers will drop to undetectable levels. We won't be able to detect them with our serological testing. Um, and so that is, especially if, so if you don't have a history on a patient and you have a negative IAT, we have no way of knowing that they have an antibody. Um, and so one group of um, antibodies that are notorious for this is our JKA and JKB, the kid family, All right? So dropping to undetectable levels. So if you are doing a transfusion reaction workup, one of the best ways to determine if it was a hemolytic transfusion reaction is to perform the DAT. In a transfusion reaction, if you're uh, DAT is positive, we will always want to perform an elution. We want to elute off what antibody is coding the donor cells, and that will allow us um, to know what antibody the patient is building. So make sure you guys are familiar with the LUIT process. Remember, um, and, and examples of an eluate, if you're investigating hemolytic disease of a newborn and you suspect ABO incompatibility, you would want to do a Lewy freeze elution. Um, if you suspect another IgG antibody, we would want to do a acid elution, such as digitonin is an example of an acid elution. And what that acid elution does is it will lower the pH, causing that um, antibody to dissociate from the cells. However, those types of elutions 
also cause the cells to lyse. Um, so the cells are no longer viable for testing. We are only wanting the eluate, all right? So now we have the antibody that is unbound from the red cells suspended in the eluate. Um, so we can run that eluate with a panel and identify the antibody that was coding patient cells. Um, remember when working up a transfusion reaction, what's first going to happen is if they had, um, an, in the example of a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction where their titer had dropped to undetectable levels, um, but then that amnestic response caused the titer to increase, the first thing that's going to happen is that antibody is going to coat donor cells. All right, so we're going to see a positive DAT, we're going to see the antibody coating the patient cells, and then we will also be able to detect that antibody in the patient plasma now. All right, um, so you'll have it attached to the donor cells as well as in the patient plasma. Um, when working up transfusion reactions, it's possible that you'll only identify the antibody coded to patient cells. It depends on timing of the sample collection. The first thing that's going to happen is that antibody is going to attach to the cells. Um, if you receive the sample before the antibody is detected in the plasma, um, then your post-transfusion IAT might be negative. Um, so I've actually seen that happen. So that can happen. But if you identify the antibody based off of the eluate, then that patient is still um, identified as having that antibody and for future transfusions must receive antigen negative blood. Um, which AHG reagent detects the IgG antibody? That would be your monospecific IgG. Um, if HLA match platelets are required, which sibling would have the best match? Um, identical twins are known to have the best likelihood of um, being an exact HLA match. Um, what type of hemolytic reaction is delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction? And here we're thinking about intravascular or extravascular. Um, remember, delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction, the antibody is coating the donor cells. That is extravascular hemolysis, meaning that the spleen is going to be um, responsible for removing those um, cells. Versus if you were given the wrong type of um, blood, if you gave a a donor to an O patient, that is going to result in intravascular hemolysis. It's going to be an immediate effect. Those cells are going to start uh, lysine immediately. Complement's going to be activated. Um, that C9 um, is going to puncture, puncture holes in the cells, causing cell lysis intravascular. Um, and again, it's the kid family is notorious for dropping to undetectable levels. They are the ones that are most associated um, with delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions. All right, and then don't forget your frequency um, calculations. You will have several frequency calculations on this exam. Um, I will give you the frequency uh, of the antigen. Um, so let's say if you needed little e, 98% um, of the population is little e positive. Okay, so I will give you that information. You do need to be familiar with your D, um, like we have been doing the whole semester. Notice that 85% of the population is D positive. All right, so if you have a patient that's type O, um, it has an antibody for which 66% of the population have the antigen, all right, so that means they're antigen positive. What is the frequency for finding antigen negative blood, all right? So remember, for the population that is antigen negative, we must subtract 66 from 100, um, and that will give us 34. And then also remember that about 45% of the population is group O, so you'll take 0.45 times 0.34, um, and that will give you about 15% of the O population is also antigen negative for this particular antigen, okay? Um, and don't forget, depending on how the question is worded, if you should include RH. Um, this question doesn't give you any type of RH frequency, so we didn't include it here. Um, but if your patient happened to be RH negative, 
we definitely want to include that only 15% of the population is RH negative um, that would be compatible for that patient, okay? And so what, what is the concern if someone that has a normal hematocrit um, is given two units of PAC cells? So if they have a normal hematocrit, there's no clinically reason for transfusion, especially red cells, um, which supplies oxygen carrying capabilities. For these individuals that get transfused when their hematocrit is normal, it's circulatory overload. Um, which could cause them to go into um, cardiac arrest um, because the heart's going to be working extra hard to pump all of that additional blood. That is why most hospitals, as part of their quality assurance program, has initiated a hemoglobin and hematocrit threshold um, that will not allow transfusions unless that patient's hematocrit um, is lower than that threshold. If a recipient develops fever and chills um, during a transfusion, what should be done? Um, first off, if the nurse calls you and tells you that they suspect a hemolytic transfusion, number one is you definitely want to stop the transfusion. Um, and if they have developed a fever, that could indicate a hemolytic transfusion reaction um, or it could be um, bacterial contamination, it could be HLA re related, you always want to tell them to stop the transfusion um, and initiate a transfusion workup. Why did that patient develop a fever? Um, and then what test in blood bank can we do to determine if a um, transfusion reaction is hemolytic or not? Again, that is your DAT. Whenever, what, regardless of what type of transfusion, regardless of what your patient's symptoms are, whether it be um, hives, um, nausea, or fever, flank pain, the first thing blood bank is going to do is, number one, we're going to check for clerical errors, make sure your patient ABO matches the unit ABO, uh, make sure the product was um, checked out to the right patient. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to do a DAT on a post-transfusion. If your DAT is positive, that indicates that um, hemolysis is occurring and antibody is attaching to those red cells. Um, so we also talked about our blood product storage and donor deferment, all right? So what temperature are red cells stored at? So red cells are always stored at refrigerated temperatures, one to six degrees. Um, what temperature is our frozen products stored at, such as FFP and cryo? Remember, they are stored at minus 18 degrees Celsius. Um, our platelets are stored at room temperature with agitation. Um, let's see. Don't forget to uh, review your donor deferment um, in the event a donor has had a piercing or tattoo. Remember that is a one-year deferment from the date of that piercing or tattoo. Um, remember if your patient has traveled to an area that is endemic for malaria, that's a one-year deferment as well. If they have lived in an area that is endemic with malaria, that is a three-year deferment. Um, and then also make sure that you will um, review your donor requirements as well. All right, so if you are working up a transfusion reaction and you suspected that a uh, type O patient received donor A red cells and you're doing your transfusion reaction workup and your DAT is found to be negative, why would that be? So it's all timing um, dependent upon the time the sample was drawn. So this is going to happen very fast and it's possible that your patient's anti-A has already attacked all of those donor A cells um, and so hemolysis has completely occurred and so when we do our DAT it might actually be negative. Um, so if a patient has five siblings and is in need of a bone marrow transplant, what is the likelihood of an almost perfect match? Again, the more siblings you have, the better chance of finding an HLA match. That's a 99% chance. 
um, if a post delivery woman types as B negative with a mixed field wheat D and the baby is B positive, should the mother receive Rogam? All right, so the first thing you want to ask yourself, um, she has a maybe she has a historical type of B negative, but now you're getting a wheat D positive reaction and the baby is RH positive. That could indicate that such a large fetal maternal bleed has occurred that some RH positive cells are now in maternal circulation. So number one, we need to give, uh, we need to do a fetal screen. And if it is positive, which it probably would be in this case, we need to do a Klyhire Betke to quantitate the number of vials of Rogam needed. Remember, one vial of Rogam, one thirty or uh, three hundred microgram um, vial of Rogam, will clear a thirty mil whole blood bleed or fifteen mils of uh, red cells. All right. So if mom has experienced a bleed greater than 30 mils, she needs additional dosage of Rogam. So we would need to do a fetal screen. If positive, then do the Klyhire Betke in our calculation to determine how many vials. Um, so this mom needs an additional dose of Rogam. So if um, mom received Rogam at 28 weeks, and remember all RH negative maternal patients are given Rogam um, that's their um, antenatal dose, okay, at 28 weeks gestation. We don't know what the baby's type is, all right, so all RH negative maternal patients are given Rogam at 28 weeks. So if you have a mom that received Rogam at 28 weeks, what will the D titer be at delivery? So it's possible, um, sometimes you will see this in blood bank, mom was given Rogam at 28 weeks, um, and then she comes to the facility for delivery, it's possible that that Rogam is still in her circulation. Um, and if you are ever trying to differentiate whether a antibody that looks like anti-D is truly active anti-D versus passive anti-D due to Rogam administration, we could always titer. A anti-D titer that is due to Rogam will never be clinically significant. It will never be greater than that one to 32. So usually if you titer anti-D and it's about a one to four or one to eight, it's probably more than likely Rogam. And remember if mom has active anti-D and the baby is RH positive, that titer is going to continuously increase. Um, that's why we always run our maternal titers um, in conjunction. So if we do a titer on her today and she comes back in two weeks, we will compare the titers. Did it increase by twofold um, and is it greater than one to 32? That would indicate that she is actively building anti-D. Um, and then, so would the mom still receive Rogam at delivery? Um, remember, whether or not mom gets the postnatal dose of Rogam is dependent on the type of the baby. If mom is RH negative and delivers an RH negative baby, there is no clinically need for a Rogam. She has not been exposed to the D antigen. If mom is RH negative and delivers a D positive baby and the fetal screen is negative, she should get one standard vial of Rogam uh, as a prophylactic treatment. However, if mom is RH negative and delivers an RH positive baby and the fetal screen is positive, indicating that during delivery, um, there was maybe a small bleed uh, and the fetal screen is positive and the Klyhire Betke needs to, be deter uh, needs to be performed, again, to determine the number of vials, okay? Um, so anytime mom is RH negative and delivers an RH positive baby, postnatal, before the postnatal administration of Rogam can be given, a fetal screen must be performed. We want to make sure that a, a bleed did not occur during delivery. If the fetal screen is negative, one standard vial of Rogam is given. If the fetal screen is positive, mom needs an additional dose of Rogam.
So if you have a um, pregnant female presents with a positive IAT at 24 weeks, what should be done? Um, again, we definitely want to identify the antibody, so we need to do a panel. Um, if that antibody is clinically significant, we will also need to perform a titer. Now, this says anti-D. I want to I reiterate here, it's not only anti-D. Anti-D is the most common antibody that we titer in blood bank. However, I would like to include any clinically significant antibody. We will titer on maternal patients, okay? So not only anti-D. If mom had Duffy A, Duffy B, JKA, JKB, Kale, all of those antibodies would need to be titered. Um, so if you have a mom that is type B and the baby is O, is this possible? Um, yes, of course, um, that is possible. And so remember your Punit square, think about the possibilities. Mom's genotype is, she is probably, uh, she has the um, B allele being expressed on, on one allele, but not the other one. Um, so she's probably, uh, her genotype would be BO. Um, and then the father could be O as well. Um, think about some scenarios that are unlikely. If you have an O mom and then the baby is typing as AB, um, that is not possible, okay? It is not possible for a type O mom to have an a, AB baby, right? O moms can have an A or B baby, not a b okay so what are some examples that could cause a false negative iat remember improper washing um, will cause a um, false negative iat as well as forgetting to add plasma um, failure to centrifuge those are all reasons to cause a false negative. Um, will HLA antibodies cause a hemolytic transfusion reaction? Remember, HLA antibodies are suspected if you have a febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction. So HLA antibodies are not associated with causing hemolysis. Um, what is the first step in working up a transfusion reaction? The first thing blood bank is going to do, clerical error. All right, we want to make sure that patient identification match, the proper sample, um, everything matches the ABO. Um, we'll repeat the ABO on our patient, perform a historical check, um, and then once we receive that post-transfusion sample, we will repeat that patient ABO, RH, IAT, um, and DAT, all right? But the very first thing is that clerical error check. Um, ABO incompatible blood um, in relation to a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. Remember, when a patient receives the wrong type of ABO, that is going to be an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. It's going to be immediate, all right? No delay if the wrong ABO is given. Um, so if mom is RH negative with a titer of anti-D, uh, 1 to 256, um, the baby is D negative, but that RH control is positive, with a positive DAT, what's the cause for those baby results, all right? Look at that D titer. That D titer is really high, definitely clinically significant, so high that it is coding baby cells, making baby appear D negative, all right? So it's the maternal anti-D coding baby cells. That is our blocked D phenomenon. Um, should that mom in that situation receive Rogam? What do you guys think? Well, she already has actively built anti-D, so giving her Rogam will not do anything for her. So she should not receive Rogam. Remember, the purpose of Rogam is to prevent alloimmunization from anti, uh, from anti D. This mom already has built anti D. Rogam will not help her. Okay, so no, she does not need Rogam.
So what product is usually suspected in a uh, patient that has an allergic reaction? Remember, those patients that have an allergic reaction are usually those patients that are IgA deficient. Um, so they will react with the donor's IgA, all right? So usually those patients that are IgA deficient have an anti-IgA um, that will attack your donor products and that causes a um, allergic reaction. So it's usually in um, those products, the amount of plasma um, is involved in our allergic reactions. So one way that we can um, prevent allergic reaction for these patients that are known to be IgA deficient is by washing the products. So if you think about washed products, there's a small amount of plasma that remains in the red cells, usually not enough to cause a problem except for um, patients that are IgA deficient as well as platelets. Um, so we can wash red cells, we can wash platelets. For plasma, um, if a patient is known to be IgA deficient, usually if they need a plasma transfusion, because we can't wash plasma, of course, um, we would want to give them IgA deficient plasma as well. Um, what's the most common cause of warm hemolytic anemia? Um, it's usually due to a autoantibody or there are some drug-induced warm autoimmune hemolytic anemias as well. Um, again, what does a positive fetal screen indicate? It indicates that either during um, maybe your maternal patient was involved in a trauma during her pregnancy or at delivery, there was a fetal maternal bleed. So the fetal screen will detect the presence of RH positive fetal cells in the maternal circulation. Remember, if your fetal screen is positive, we must do a Klyhire Betke. Klyhire Betke will quantitate the number of doses. Um, and then make sure you guys interpret your cross match results, being able to identify if a unit is compatible versus incompatible. Remember, any positive reaction at initial spin 37 or AHG during the cross match procedure indicates incompatibility, indicates your patient's plasma is attacking the donor red cells. And remember, that's your major cross match donor plasma, I mean, sorry, patient plasma mixed with donor red cells. Okay, that's the major cross match what we currently perform in blood bank. And remember the minor cross match is no longer performed where you mix uh, donor plasma with patient red cells. Um, and the reason that's no longer performed is because we don't um, usually have whole blood any longer. All right. Um, so that concludes our review, um, final exam review again. Make sure you prepare, um, make sure you review evaluating hemolytic disease of the newborn, um, interpreting your cross matches, donor requirements, donor deferral, product storage and expiration times. Um, I didn't mention your anticoagulant. So let's think about your red cells that are um, used with, uh, CPDA. So remember CPDA1, CPDA2, those have a 35-day expiration time. If you add the preservative Adsol, that extends the expiration to 42 days. Okay, remember irradiation. Irradiation changes your expiration date to 28 days um, from the collection date. All right, so if you already have a unit of red cells um, that is going to expire, let's say tomorrow, and you irradiate, well, of course, the expiration date doesn't change. So it's 28 days or the original expiration date, whichever comes first, all right? Let's see, I have a question. Sarah asks, will there be similar panel type questions?
when it comes to HD and um, yes, I would be prepared for that, Sarah. Yeah. Are you talking about like Louis Freeze Eluit versus um, Acid Elution Eluits? Oh yeah, differentiating ABO versus RH. Yeah, make sure you're familiar with that. Remember, typically if you are doing a um, eluit on baby cells, so you're eluting off maternal uh, antibody and you suspect ABO, we will do a Louis freeze um, and we'll run it with A cells, B cells, O positive cells and O negative cells. Um, if it reacts with A, then it's anti-A coding baby cells. If it reacts with anti-B, then it's anti-B. Um, if it's reacting with A cells and B cells, then it's A comma B. Um, if it reacts with the O positive cells or O negative cells, that indicates um, another IgG antibody was involved. Um, and then you would want to do an acid elution if that was the case. Um, and hospitals handle that different. They might run a full panel. Um, they might run a condensed panel for antibody identification on that. So um, yeah, differentiating ABO from um, RH or another IgG antibody. Just wanted to make sure I'm not leaving anything out. I think that's it. All right, so as you guys are studying, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to let me know. Um, again, your lab practical is due today. So if you um, have taken it, that's a really good study tool. If you have not taken it, um, pay attention on it. Um, and a really good way to study for this exam is, um, and I'll open up the previous blood bank exam so you guys can review. Um, I'll do that right now. And, um, I hope you guys enjoyed this semester. So this is our last lecture. Um, and let me know if you have any questions. Yes. I have a question. Um, when it comes to rebam, so like when you have an RH negative mom and a positive baby, but the hemolytic disease of the newborn is caused by like kill, are you, you're still giving them Rogam, even though that is, is it just a standard dose or do they need more? Because I think that was a question on the exam uh, yesterday and I wasn't sure. Okay, so if you have a mom that is RH negative, um, she has anti kale and she delivers an RH positive baby. Mm -hmm. Yes, she should still get Rogam. And it would just be like a standard dose. Um, did it a uh, fetal screen? You would have to do a fetal screen. So the dosage is dependent upon the fetal screen. I'm not sure what it was on the exam. I don't know if it gave us the fetal screen or not. I think only one of them gave us a pot of positive one. It was a negative one. Sarah, I don't know. You said, I, <laughs> um, yeah, but I just remember it, it was, a, it was the first one, right, Peyton? Yeah. Yeah, that was a negative fetal screen. Yeah, so I wasn't sure.